good on you. Thanks, Skyler. And thanks, as usual, to Lillian Frontiers for organising logistics of this. And let me apologise to everyone who's had to re-register. They, Lillian Frontiers had some trouble with Zoom and they lost their primary account and was getting little or no help from Zoom to re-establish that, which is why we had to postpone last week. So there's about 70 or 80 people re-registered. So thank you and I really appreciate it. And once again, sorry. Uh, Alex Russo is not joining us today he's been called to another plant in the church and dwight group and as we speak now he's on a plane but that's fine so we're going to do a couple of things firstly tony um burns who you've all met before and jeremy are here jeremy morlock tony was at CarterCon nine about a month ago and he's got some uh had some observations there from CarterCon nine particularly with uh in respect to Mark Rosenthal's closing statement. So Jeremy's, uh, sorry, Anthony's just, Tony's just going to talk to us about that very briefly. Over to you, Tony. Yeah, let me just say, first of all, it was my first experience at Kodakon and uh, I appreciate both the size and scope of the event. It was large enough that I knew no one other than my uh, two other colleagues. <clears throat> but small enough that, you know, you can network easily and uh, establish new contacts and friendships. Um, the event spoke to me both on the Kata side of my uh, job duties, as well as the TWI uh, side of my job duties. But you're speaking, uh, Mark had the closing thoughts. And yes, that's correct. In his closing thoughts, he shared a slide deck as he was speaking and this is my first ex exposure to Mark, Mark and his, uh, what he does. And my kind of my takeaway from Mark is he respectfully speaks his mind, uh, whether he's in alignment or he doesn't align with some things. But then, you know, he wrapped it all up with, uh, you know, our job is, is CI managers, training managers, people who influence culture is, uh, in his quote, he says, our job is to create an environment where ordinary people, which we all have ordinary people, we all are ordinary people, receive extraordinary support to accomplish things that no one else has done. And to me, that just resonated with everything that I've learned about both Kata and uh, the TWI uh, job instructions platform. So uh, I appreciate it so much. I quoted Mark and I've attached it to my email. That's how strong of a statement it was to me. And what's what's yeah? You know, how in what way do you feel that's adjusted your approach um, in the last you know you were there a month ago? So in what way has attending the summit and maybe that statement itself adjusted your approach? Or the two uh, two bullet points on there. Um, Got to remember we're dealing with ordinary people, and I highlight people right. They come to work um, full of uh, you know everything that happened from last time they're working. So you got to understand their mindset, their perception of what we're asking to do. And so to do that, you've got to give them this extraordinary platform and uh, ensure that um, success or failure, you're going to be there as a resource to either cheer them on or support them and help them learn from, uh, you know, moments of failure. So you do those two things right, and that's where the incredible things come and that no one else has done. So that's yeah, how it so I think. I think what I'm hearing you say there is it's up to us, not them. No, it's not their. It's not their job. You know, left to their own devices. Most of my employees, you know, they come to work with good intentions, but yeah. you know, they want to do their job as they were taught to and then go home at the end of the day and do whatever's outside of work. Yeah, yeah. But it's up to us. Like we tend to throw things back to people and say, why aren't they doing that? I think what you're taking away from this, what I hear you saying, is that it's up to us to create the environment, not up to them to do the work, not, not to, to do what we want them to do. It's like, if we create the environment, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I love that. Well done. Thank you for that. So, Jeremy, at our last mentoring session, you said you were seeing a change in the language of your people. 
Uh, your current, or the last time we spoke to this group, the current scientific thinking focus was on constant weights, um, but you haven't necessarily got things in the right order, you said, and you'll explain that. But can you talk a little bit about um, the change in the language of the pe of your people and the development of their thinking? Yeah, so like you said last time, a couple of learning lessons from last time, observations, uh, trying to get people to do this, but to Tony's point, uh, they're naturally doing it. That's what I said before. They're naturally doing this. So try to get on my own way. You're trying to use your own kata cycle to evaluate, right? So one of the obstacles is me trying to force training versus let it just happen naturally and then show them how they're already doing it correctly. Um, with the terminology, really where I'm doing that is the card. You know, we all have these cards we got, you know, use that card, all the terms you really need are on there. Make, I use the card, I make it displayed so they know I'm using it, I make it obvious. I let them describe what they're doing. And then I, at the end, align with the terminology, right? So they may describe something, I'll say, well, that's our challenge, right? That's what we're calling the challenge. This is our target condition. You've already said this, that's the target condition. So I use the words to reinforce what they're already saying. You know, just as a way to show that they already know it, I'm just giving some yes. form and structure to it so that we can all talk the same language. Sure. Um, and what's the uh, what what and what event, what benefits are you seeing? Are you seeing well? It's a leading question. Are you seeing benefits from creating that common language? And if so, you know, what, what sort of benefits? I'd say the biggest benefit is it kind of aligns everybody to what we're doing. So I think I said before that sometimes it's a little haphazard, right? People are naturally doing this, but they don't do it with the structure that we were taught. So the terminology kind of aligns people with that structure, makes them realize there is a structure. So just give an example of one of the benefits. Uh, you kind of already talked about the constant weights. Originally, when they were doing this, they were trying to reduce the PMs on a certain wear item. But they realized that that was actually not what they were accomplishing in the end. They were achieving more consistent weights over longer periods of time. Uh, and that became their new challenge focus, right? So it kind of let people realize like, okay, I, I see how this thing's supposed to go. Um, the words are making sense. I know what I'm getting a better idea of what I'm supposed to do. Uh, so really, data collection is another one. They always like to just kind of see what happens, and I kind of force them to say, "Well, what can we measure?" Right? You want to get a yeah. you want to get a response to your experiment. What's the best way to do that quickly? And uh, things like that are also helping them, you know, realize, "Oh, okay, that makes sense." Right? We got to we have a a target condition, we got to be able to measure whether we're achieving that or not based on the actual condition today and tomorrow. How do you measure that actual condition today? How do you measure that condition tomorrow? Um, really, those are the biggest benefits, just really people kind of aligning. They're already thinking to the same structure and getting us all on the same page. Sure. <clears throat> I find it interesting to listen to you speak, Jeremy, because you know, we did that training in October last year with you guys. And everyone found it a bit strange, if you like, um, the, the Toyota kind of speak. But even in the way, what I'm noticing, and it, 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 even in the way you're speaking now, it's coming um, naturally. It's it's coming naturally out of your mouth, whereas it wasn't six months ago. And I suspect <laughs> there's only one way that's happened. No, I'm not, I don't mean that in a bad way, yeah, yeah. but it wasn't. It wasn't for anyone because it's something that's new. So the, And the only way you get to that is through practice um through deliberate practice so, but Correct. you've been less formal than others i would say in your deliberate practice but you're still practiced haven't you yeah correct so that's why i said like at first i think i tried to be deliberate first rollouts were really trying to train people ourselves and we realized that wasn't working right we lost interest people weren't they don't pick it up in the same way you don't have the same uh, amount of time to learn it so I kind of realized quickly they were doing it naturally. So I just said, okay, well, you guys keep doing what you're doing and I'll just point out how well you're doing it and you don't even know it. And I'll provide yes. you with some structure to keep progress moving. Yeah. yeah. Which then allowed me yeah, to good. obviously practice the patterns of thinking, yeah. Yeah, you've almost practiced it covertly rather than overtly, which exactly. I find interesting. Worked better actually and the Exactly. Yeah. It's probably fits in with your style a little more and the um, structure. What benefit do you expect to see is we're still going back to a level of structure there. What, what the benefit do you think that will provide? 
Uh, I already know the benefit there. So I have a few people that are very involved, right? They want, they're bought into it quite significantly. Uh, so give you an example of that. One person that's changing out these wheels has a whiteboard. He writes on the whiteboard, made notes. If you ever change a whiteboard on any of the other shifts that I don't work, note it up here. I was measuring the wheels and said, one of your wheels changed because it either got better over time or somebody put a new one on there. He took that and said, went right to the whiteboard and said, nobody made a note. I need to go talk to everybody and see who changed that wheel. So right there, he's like figuring out, you're messing up my data. How am I going to get this to the next step? So he, right there is just a living example for me of somebody who bought into the structure and is yes. now actually taking that structure and trying to impress it upon his colleagues, right? Which is, yeah, for me, that's, that's the best so way to learn. Absolutely. So his experiment, if you like, became uncontrolled because there was <laughs> other stuff going on he didn't know about. Correct. <laughs> and he reacted in the right manner towards Correct. that. That's terrific. Let's get it back yeah. on back, yep. Yeah. yeah, really good example. Thank you. Tony, if we can move on to you, Tony, you um, downsized your approach to practice is what you've described. And we had a session last Friday that I want a uh, mentoring session that I'll refer to in a minute. But just let, let the group who are attending know about this downsizing to your approach, please. Yeah, so following our uh, training back uh, last year, uh, I, um, I tried to apply the Kata methodology to two pretty significant problems, um, both of them. I since have learned were well out of my uh, scope of expertise. Not that the problems normally wouldn't fall on my plate, but trying to use uh, a kind of problem solving methodology uh, and being just so new to it was uh, setting myself up for failure. And I won't lie, I was frustrated that I wasn't very successful in my first attempt, nor my second. And, you know, I like to use baseball terminology, and I was really close to striking out. So what I understand you to be saying is that the, what you chose as your learning platforms were too big, too hard. So it wasn't a great learning platform. You were trying to drive. You were trying to drive an F1 when you couldn't yet drive, essentially. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's a, yep, that's it. So tell us, uh, what have you done? How have you adjusted? So, so it's interesting, though. People will say you made a mistake or you probably thought you made a mistake, but you did, the place didn't burn down. So in essence, that was an experiment from which you learned. So you adjusted. Tell us about that adjustment. Right. Yeah, well, you're, you're correct. So I had some time between uh, my second failure and this third attempt to really reflect on it because uh, not doing kata doesn't mean I'm not doing my job. There's plenty for me to do. So I really wanted to reflect on what would be a great platform for me to learn the methodology on. And, you know, uh, on the heels of KataCon, you know, I realized after talking to some uh, other CI managers there that, you know, I really needed to find something that was small visible but you know the level of complexity of the situation wasn't going to consume consume me or consume my thought process where i could really you know get into the pattern like jeremy said you know use the card per se so um if i could i'll share the screen with my uh, problem yeah can you are you can you share screen or does um, they have to be host? Skylar. I got to be host. Skylar, I don't know if you can fix that. I just sent you that to you, Tony. Okay. So, can you guys see this tool cart? Uh, no. Yep. Yes, we can. Well, we can almost see. Yes, we can now. Brilliant. Okay. Well yeah, so this is a tool cart in one of our uh, lines, and you can see it's titled, it's for the machine operators. It's every tool they would need um, when they need it to do some kind of adjustment, repair, or some, some kind of autonomous maintenance. 
This picture is uh, taken while I was at Kodakon. And you can see just the tool carts in disarray and several of the key tools are missing. And so it got me thinking, and, and there is a, a factory lead that owns this, and I'll bring up this email that you and I shared. And so the, the challenge statement is to always have the correct tool in the correct place on that 5S cart and make it easily accessible by employees. So uh, it's a simple cart, simple challenge statement. And it really would allow me to both uh, coach the young man who owns this cart and also at the same time practice the methodology, which I'm still such a rookie at. So that's where we started, Oscar. Yep. And tell us what happened. So uh, we collected data um, both on, uh, you know, which tools were missing. Quite honestly, we'd find a tool in the wrong spot. We'd find the cart stored in the wrong location. So we collected data and I would meet with uh, the cart owner daily and we would talk through his data through the first week. And we came up with, uh, you know, a target condition and, you know, it was just basically taking the current data that he had and improving one of those categories. So we wanted to improve uh, the right tool in the right location. And, and we, I went out there daily and uh, we just started uh, his first experiment, which was he was gonna communicate to his colleagues across other shifts. Um, hey guys, this is important. Talk with your operators, let's make sure uh, we're putting things back. So it was just a communication experiment. If he uh, told his colleagues how important it was. Well, a day after the communication, and I don't even think the communication had made it out to all of his colleagues, maybe to one of his colleagues, because the other two were still on their uh, days off. The cart just went through an amazing transformation. And, uh, you know, you and I talked about it. This was the cart day two of uh, his experiment. And we cannot attribute the success of the cart all of a sudden to uh, uh, you know, the communication because it was still incomplete. So I've talked to you and I suspect what we're seeing here is what we call the Hawthorne effect, right? All of a sudden people are huddling around his tool cart and we're taking notes, we're collecting data we haven't asked anybody to do anything yet. And all of a sudden the cart is uh, significantly in compliance. So the interesting question there then is, and I know you and I talked about this Friday, the experiment didn't go as predicted if you like. So what did you learn? Because you didn't even get that far. So, but what have you learned? Just by applying this thinking, what have you learned? Um, well, I think the learning is, is, uh, well, it, it's, it's hard for me to verbalize it. I mean, cause I, I've seen the Hawthorne effect before. Um, I'm not sure if the fellow who owns his tool cart or is responsible for his tool cart understood what was going to happen or had even seen this kind of stuff before, but, uh, you know, all of a sudden just, you know, the importance of this cart demonstrated by us huddling around it, talking around it, and collecting data around it had a cultural effect. Yes, had fo it brought focus. Yeah. yeah. Maybe our uh, first experiment could have been, hey, let's just start posting some data and seeing what the data could. I mean, yeah, I'm letting this uh, fellow Alex uh, come up with his next experiments. So, and I don't even know sure. if I have you had it in in the forefront of my mind to say, to even suggest maybe uh, by posting data, we would have uh, seen such a significant compliance improvement. Yeah, no, that doesn't matter. Whether you had it in the forefront of your mind or not, it's the learning that counts. I think that's one thing that we, one thing with Carter, uh, practicing scientific thinking, we need to get our own heads around is that be just because you didn't see something coming that's not bad or that's not wrong or that's not a mistake or inability on your part or anyone's part. That's yeah. sort of the whole point. 
do something and see what happens. And if you, if something comes that you didn't see coming, that's sort of what it's about. And that's okay. Yeah, yeah I believe so, well, you uh, mentioned in our instructions, you know, some of the uh, most significant learnings come from either unforeseen uh, actions uh, or failures. Yeah. yeah, and I've said to you guys, well, I say it a lot, if the place doesn't burn down, that's okay. So as coaches, we need to manage the risk of the experiment causing a disaster. If it's not going to cause a disaster, then let it happen. And what we learn is what we learn, whether it be good or bad or interesting or uninteresting or what we expected or what we didn't. And you did make the statement, Tony, that you said on Friday when we were talking, it could not have been a better learning carter for you. Yeah. Can you just elaborate on that? Well, so this is uh, just my own inexperience coming out, but my learning is, uh, you know, no matter what became of this tool cart, I mean, financially, it's less than $2,000. Um, we could not have done anything horrifically wrong that would have put the organization in jeopardy. You know, yeah, we may have had to buy a couple more screwdrivers or sockets, but this is such a good project for me and for uh, Alex because good or bad, we wouldn't have derailed the organization. Sure. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we were going to learn something without causing a schmozzle. Yeah, well said. So that's what we mean by better learning cut, and that's spot on. And uh, another thing we said, you said on Friday, you used the words um, hor horribly wrong when talking about practicing DK. Uh, and I pulled you up on that and said, we've, I think as leaders, we've got to get away from that mindset. We've got to get away, as, uh, and it's back on what I said before, as long as within the box of risk, and mm -hmm. it can never be horribly wrong. Yeah. All it means is we learned something very, we learned a hell of a lot that we didn't expect. So it's not horribly wrong. It's our learnings were huge. And as long as we're in the box of risk, we're right. I, I just want to go back. Um, and Andrea, great to know that you're with us. Andrea Lee's from Normac, just um, west of, just a little west of Chicago. Um, and Andrea has posted this question. And I'd like to go back to it. She's and it relates to what you said at the start, Tony, and she's interested on uh, in both of you guys what you think. So what we understood at the start, Tony, was um, your how we our role as leaders is to create this environment where people can succeed. How do we? Andrea has asked, how do we? How do we communicate that to other leaders? What are your thoughts there? I mean, we. We're gaining an understanding of that. She says she has trouble uh, communicating that modus operandum to other leaders. How do you think you guys may go about that? How will you communicate this our this um, responsibility to create an environment where people can thrive? How do we get other people to do it? How do we get our leaders who report to us to think and act that way? Do you want to have a crack first, Jeremy? Sure. Uh, well, my first thought is to share your my experiences with them, right? Share my success stories. Um, obviously, what we've said is pretty straightforward, right? Give them the opportunity. But I think it's more about control. I think we talk about this a lot in our training, whether you're controlling or guiding the situations. And I think that's the key question somebody has to ask themselves. Are they trying to control the situation or guide the situation? As long as you're focused on guiding, I think that environment will happen naturally that's my thought process yeah sure and that relate um uh, jay atley from zingerman's i heard him speak at an ame conference in about 2018 <clears throat> and he talked about you know as a coach your role is to guide people down the corridor and when they bump into either wall that's okay just don't let them bump into it too hard that they hurt themselves but if they move a bit around the corridor that's fine but we're guiding them down the the corridor in this way rather than um that rather than you know grabbing them by the hand and pulling them along so to speak and i think part of that is to allow them to bump into the corridor just don't and if you can see they're going to bump in and not hurt themselves then let them bump into it yeah um but if they're going to hurt themselves you got to pull them up what's your thoughts tony how do we get this um how do we how might we communicate this to other leaders or get other leaders to start thinking this way? Andrea is interested in knowing. Well, I'll, I'll say for Jeremy and I, 
we're probably in a great situation where church and Dwight, this kind of mentality already comes from the executive leadership team and all the way down to each site. Um, so if I weren't in such a, a, a great position here, uh, you know, it's, you gotta get a couple small wins, even if they're kind of covert. And then once uh, your small wins are meaningful, then you can just build off that propaganda. It works both uphill and downhill, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Andrew, from my two Bob's worth, I think one of the big things is to, and, I, and I've seen it sort of crop up in the last six months, is to help people understand that, and we've already mentioned this, help people understand that that when something happens you didn't expect, that's okay. That it's not a mistake. I think we're conditioned through our education system and um, and our training to that it, that if we might, you know, we're conditioned that when something happens that we didn't expect, that's wrong or a mistake. I'm starting to believe that that is a huge hurdle in developing this type of leadership. Is that um, that that, it's, that if something goes, if something un, if something happens that we don't expect, then that's okay. That's a learning experience. It's not wrong and it's not a mistake. And I think that holds a lot. I think that perception of a mistake or I need to get it right uh, holds a lot of people back. So one of our primary functions as leaders is to create that environment where it's not a mistake. It's just a learning event. But we need to make sure what they're doing stays within the box of risk. So it's a very the broad answer is Andrea. I don't know if that helps. Um, if you try it, then, then um, you know, I'd love to hear what your responses are. So I think unless either one of the Jeremy or Tony have any, for, any uh, comment, further comment, I think we'll pull it up there. We're a little bit inside the, um, the half an hour, but I think we'll pull it up there. And Skylar, can you remember, or do you have listed when our, when our next session is? It's in July sometime, I think. Um, let me give me one second. I can probably tell you. I should have had it ready, shouldn't I? I believe Sorry it's July eleventh, but I could be wrong. Yeah, that yeah, that rings a bell. All right, Jeremy and Tony, as always, really appreciate you putting aside half an hour of your time. Uh, um, I, and I trust those listening found that valuable. But to hear people speak who are actually having a crack is um is very important to certainly very important to me and the people who've registered so thank you very much for your time i really appreciate it appreciate and you. skylar skylar thanks for working through the troubles you've had in the last 10 days or so i know it hasn't been fun <laughs>